uh, evidence for equity, uh, evidence for all. Um, we're delighted uh, to see so many of you here surviving to the last plenary, um, and we have a wonderful lineup of uh, speakers for you. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Vivian Welch from the Campbell Collaboration, Editor-in-Chief of the Campbell Library, and my co-chair, uh, Sally Green, is co-director of Cochrane Australia and also um, uh, chair of Cochrane's Knowledge Translation Strategy. Um, so we're delighted to welcome you to this session about evidence for equity. Uh, we really want to uh, shine a light on the challenges of inequities uh, in this world um, that we've already heard about at this, uh, this great conference. Um, and also uh, look at some great examples where evidence has been used to uh, address inequities. And um, we're looking forward to uh, our three speakers. Thanks, Vivian. It's, um, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker for this afternoon's session, uh, Sifo Matati. Sifo is the founding executive director of Oxfam South Africa and has two decades of experience in human rights and social justice movement in Southern Africa. She has expertise in working with people and organisations advocating for just distribution of power and resources. Welcome, Sifo. Um, thanks. Um, just to say a very quick um, special thanks to the organizers of the conference um, for the opportunity to be part um, of the many, many sessions um, where I certainly have learned a great deal. But it's also been great to meet um, some of um, my old um, friends and comrades. Um, including, you know, um, uh, scientific researchers and, um, um, and doctors and others. So thank you very much. So I was 23 years old. Um, I'd buried enough of my neighbors, cousins, aunts, and knew enough of those who were still living but had the slimming disease. In clinics, when we went for contraceptives, nurses were showing us uh, pictures of emaciated people who obviously were dying. In schools, universities, the media, we were being told that AIDS kills. We were hearing about the rise in rapes of virgins by men who believe that that could cure HIV. Our government was at first too busy with other things, even though liberation fighters who had returned from exile, like Chris Arnie and others, had warned about the dangers of ignoring HIV and AIDS. They'd seen the impact of, the, of that in the countries where they'd been in exile. Millions of lives were being lost. As people affected by HIV, we were hearing about what is going on in other parts of the continent, how people were dying, but we were also hearing about what was going on in places like the US, Europe, especially that the tide was turning there, that clinical trials were showing that lives could be prolonged and quality of life improved. In time, drugs were becoming more widely accessible in the north where some people could afford. Then a group of people living with HIV formed the treatment action campaign and soon after I joined. The story was compelling. It went like this. There are drugs that can save lives, but they will never be available to us here because they are too expensive. We all believed we were at risk of HIV, and certainly the people I was seeing dying looked um, very much like me. As a daughter of a domestic worker who at the time earned just over a dollar a day, my fate was sealed if I got infected. Many myths had taken root by then. And by then our government was at the heart of spreading myths. For 10 years we fought a war of propaganda and falsehoods with as much of the evidence we could find as possible. Stories of people who were alive 
By then, we'd connected with ACT UP, fr Act Up friends in the United States. We said to them, those of you on treatment through the clinical trials must come here and, and show and tell the story. We asked the scientists to come sit with us and explain how the treatments worked. We went to clinics and spoke to nurses to say there is another picture to show. Doctors who had become tired of telling their patients nothing could be done soon joined in. We spent endless hours in science class understanding the nature of the DNA, disease progression in HIV, and the mechanisms of action of the different drugs. We turned scientific evidence that was piling up into a tool of power in the hands of affected people who needed it to fight and to save their lives. Then we had to tackle the price issue. Of course, there was the issue of big pharma propaganda machinery to contend with. We worked with trade lawyers to find out how patent laws could be managed in the interests of public health. There was enough evidence that HIV, at least in South Africa and certainly in our continent, had become a serious enough threat to public health. And so the case was made that we had an emergency. We worked with health economists to build evidence that the most expensive thing the country could do at the time is not to treat people. Meanwhile, the propaganda machinery of the state was on overdrive, ignoring all evidence except that which supported their claims for, you know, in order for them to do nothing or as little as possible. Of course, we were called all kinds of names and accused of being in the pockets of drug companies, even as they too hated us for exposing their profiteering tendencies. A coalition of forces driven by the mutual interest of saving lives using evidence creatively was born and eventually won. Today, more than four million people are living productive lives, the caring for their children, the sustaining our nation and its economy. Those people, many of those would have died otherwise. There's a long battle ahead as new medicines and related technologies are still too expensive. The point is, among other things, we took very seriously the work um, that many of you have been doing of building evidence, collating it to tell a compelling story and turning evidence into power in the hands of people who were affected by the problems and policymakers who wanted to do something about it. So I'm mentioning that story to say that what you are doing, what you've been talking about over the last three and a half days is really, really important. The work that you do of building evidence to solve social problems works. At least here, and I think in many parts of the world, as we know, with the you know, progress that's been made on HIV AIDS, it saved lives and continues to do so. And for those of us who've been involved in the struggle, because of it, because of the work that you do, it will never be possible for people to accept that it's not possible, so thank you. In this morning's plenary, there was a debate about the challenges of evidence, the neutrality of science, and all of those things, and yes, we must continue the fight to liberate life-saving scientific research from profit and other motives. There was also talk about communicating evidence this morning, um, and in the experience I just shared, I mean, we didn't always get it right, um, but we learned um, and tried many things. With evidence taught to us by scientific researchers, and you know, some of us even spent time observing how they were actually producing these drugs. We ourselves learned how to use evidence, but also understood as activists how to contribute in, in producing it. We went door to door to sit with mothers holding sick children in their hands to explain that they went powerless. We used the evidence to push for accountability and many of you who follow the story know how many times we took government to court and you know, using the evidence that was mounting around the things that could be done 
around HIV AIDS. Then we brought journalists to our workshops who mobilized others to find out more. Yes, I sit back now and look at some of the mistakes we made, but the point um, that was made unequivocally through this experience and certainly one that I think um, affirmed my belief um, in evidence and the amazing things we could do with it, you know, is that we took it seriously and we made it work for people. There's so much to share in this regard, but I'm going to move um, quite fast now um, in the interest of time. I work for Oxfam, as I was introduced. I lead um, the first African affiliate of Oxfam International, which is a global development organization working across 94 countries. As Oxfam, we choose to be excited that as many government, the, about the fact that many governments have signed up for the Sustainable Development Goals. We know that it's not going to happen without an organized movement pushing for accountability. So SDG and its targets is really uh, XDG3 and its ta you know, bold targets, um, which very much assume a framework of um, you know, total equity is very exciting for us. But against this ambition, three things are already concerning us, and we're building evidence around these three and many other areas. And the first issue is really the financing of healthcare. It's not new information and there's mounting evidence that heavy government funding for healthcare is the way that most countries have achieved or have made great progress to achieving universal healthcare coverage. It's interesting for us that even the World Bank now acknowledges that. Um, we heard the president of the bank say that, uh, you know, how they talk about how the bank advised Thailand against the country's plans to expand free healthcare page through the public purse. But we've also hear him admit that Thailand didn't accept the bank advice, uh, bank's advice and how that has helped the country move, you know, um, leaps forward. Um, and the country, you know, with all of the challenges that remain, you know, is an important example of, you know, um, how far we, how much progress we can make towards universal health care. In our own country, South Africa, a very complex country, <laughs> small as it is, you know, is an example of the dangers of relying on, you know, insurance to provide financing for health care um, and failing to, you know, manage that well. Because we've also seen, yes, in other parts of the world how that's been uh, managed to advance um, equity. In the country, you know, in, 20, in the 2011-2012 budget, um, we saw how the total spend, and you'll have to divide that by the current rate of, um, in dollars, you know, the total spend on health care was 246.6 billion rands, um, just over the, you know, um, WHO uh, target of, 20, of 5%, and so that's positive. But we can see how the two-tier system um, in, our, in our case has entrenched inequity as 48.5% of the total budget for health care covers only 60% of the population who mostly access through private health care, whilst 80% rely on the rest. We know the trend not, is not new in South Africa, and the point there is that we have to find better mechanisms that promote, e promote e equity. Now, you know, we're talking here about evidence, and of course, uh, it's important that, you know, um, we show that we're not just uh, sucking these arguments out of our thumbs. I'm not going to go through all of the studies we've done, and if you're interested in, in following our work um, on evidence um, for health equity, you can go to our website. But just to say that, um, you know, mention a couple of those studies that we've done, um, you know, and how we've reached um, our evidence. Um, you know, there's a report there on, on universal health care, health coverage that you'll find um, where we are showing how, you know, this could be achieved. 
But we are, of course, concerned that, uh, you know, and we know that we are not the only ones producing evidence. Many of you here and many people in the world are pre have been producing this evidence. But we're concerned that despite mounting evidence that, um, you know, in, and that's been um, documented in many high quality studies, some governments and donors still promote various forms of insurance, um, including private insurance. Now, the point is not that we are against um, you know, private insurance, it's really important, but it's really important that, um, you know, in re that um, this is monitored for the extent to which it promotes access um, and helps us achieve um, you know, universal health care as opposed to enrich a few. The second issue that we are tracing and are building evidence around is um, you know, this trend around the delivery models of healthcare. It seems that, um, you know, again, despite evidence, the world is moving further away, um, you know, from publicly funded and publicly delivered healthcare into privatized um, or commercialized modes of healthcare provision. And many excuses are being used, you know, like in places, for instance, like, you know, Europe where, you know, people are talking about patients' choices or, you know, lack of public fin financing in the, in the rest of the world. And privatization is being peddled as the solution that's going to help us address, you know, um, access. But of course, um, you know, alongside others, we are documenting and following the story um, and showing how, you know, it's not as simple as that. That privatization um, of healthcare or the use, you know, of mechanisms like insurance, um, if not managed for equity, will undermine the very goal of, of, of um, achieving universal access. Um, you know, the many places in the world now um, where, you know, this idea of triple P's is being promoted. Um, and research we've done, again, you'll find this on, on our website, you know, is showing how, again, it's not as simple as that. Triple, triple P's are not the panacea, um, you know, to creating access. And again, not managed well, um, you know, they will undermine access. I'm not going to go through all of the, 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 the examples again, but, um, you know, the point is that the debate on the role of the private sector in healthcare continues globally. And we are trying to use the evidence available to guard against, you know, unmitigated um, and wholesale privatization of healthcare and the treatment of health as a commodity instead of as a right. The last issue, I mean, I already kind of, uh, the story I started with, um, I guess, speaks to, to some of this. And that's the issue of access to medicine. Now, we know that despite the progress made at least around HIV AIDS and to some extent around malaria, um, you know, the story the, um, is not rosy. I mentioned the example in the beginning the battle we've fought here, which still continues, but added to it is the rise of non-communicable -commun diseases. I spoke about, you know, the campaign that we mounted for access, um, you know, to affordable um, antiretroviral therapy. The fact that the struggles we fought back in the day, when despite clear medical evidence on the effectiveness of, um, you know, AIDS treatments, because our government lacked political will, you know, we wasted so much time. But I, I also mentioned the issue, the challenges um, which are continuing and, and, and for which, um, you know, we really need um, political will um, and better solutions of the, you know, the issue of profit. But despite the evidence on how low ARV prices um, led to 16 million people on treatment. We know that pharmaceutical companies in rich countries still refuse to, to come near the monopoly um, of companies enshrined in intellectual property rules. 
they still want the world to be held to ransom, and you know, especially poor people of the world held to ransom to the mantra that the only way to achieve research and development is stronger intellectual property rules. But we know, um, and we didn't invent this evidence, that there are many other ways. Many of you will know about Ban Ki-moon's um, you know, high-level high panel that looked at um, particularly the issue um, of policy incoherence between trade rules, um, that is intellectual property rules, public health, and human rights. Oxfam, alongside others, participated in that panel. The panel debated the issues with the help of a technical advisory group and very wide consultation and contribution for, from a variety of stakeholders, including pharmaceutical companies themselves, academics, governments, and others. You know, the, the report was released. One of the great recommendations is to delink the financing of research and development from the price um, of the resulting products you should really take the time to read the report because I think it, 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 it makes important evidence-based recommendations about how you know, we should explore more th um, you know, avenues to ensure that we are not prisoner to this challenge that um, you know, um, drugs, um, life-saving medicines um, you know, are property of those who invent them. I'm going to end um, now with just showing again how you know, the battle ahead um, you know, is, is, is huge. I'm not going to go into too much detail again. You can read um, this story, which is not just the story, and that's the story of Tobega Dagi. Tobega spent um, a lot of time suffering and sick and, and eventually died because her own medical insurance, um, you know, couldn't afford the treatment, government couldn't afford the cancer treatment, um, and so she died. But in my own work in South Africa now, um, I see many, many people who rely particularly um, on private health care, but also even those with health care insurance die because the medicines are simply too expensive. And so I guess the point is we have a lot of work to do, and the kind of alliance that was possi made possible through the various initiatives to really you know, build evidence um, that supports informed policies um, through the HIV AIDS movement must again um, be possible. We've been speaking about the post-truth post world. The summit takes place at a difficult time in the world when our attention as people of the world you know, is being dis diverted from, um, you know, solving the real challenges of climate change and building the evidence-based, um, and it's being diverted by all men of nefarious interests who, and this is important for us as an organization that believes in equity be and, and accountability because the longer they divert attention um, away from, you know, using evidence that has been developed and is credible, the more we move further away from accountability. And so for us, this is an important issue. This is an important issue for, um, for accountability. Certainly in healthcare, but it applies across the board. So again, I want to say thanks to all of you, the troops in the world, you know, that um, works hard to build this evidence. At a, and I think that the Alliance um, has never been more urgent. And, and so thanks very much. Thank you very much, Sifo. Um, thank you really for uh, reminding us um, that we have to make the evidence work for the people and, uh, and your great um, stories. Um, so I'd like to now introduce our second speaker. Um, he has pre-recorded uh, his talk for us, but he, will, he is with us now, um, uh, Gonzalo Hernandez Lacona. Um, he is with us by Skype, so he will be here for the question period. Um, Gonzalo Hernandez Lacona is founding, uh, founder and executive secret secretary of the National Council for Evaluation of Social Development Policy, uh, CONEVAL, uh, in Mexico. 
Under the leadership of um, Gonzalo Hernandez Licona, Conevel has distinguished itself as an institution with autonomy that generates rigorous and transparent information about the magnitude of poverty in Mexico and also the performance of social programs. So I'd like to now uh, invite the tech team to uh, pull up uh, Gonzalo's presentation. Hello to everyone. I really wish I could be in Cape Town right now. But thank you very much for allowing me to be, there, to be there in this virtual way. My talk is going to be about how is it possible to convince policymakers to use evidence in a systematic way. I think one of the nicest goals we have in science we have as evaluators is that our evidence, our evaluations could be used by policymakers all the time. Sometimes, however, this is not possible. Let me tell you that a week ago, exactly, the 8th of September, the Ministry of Finance in Mexico addressed Congress and their budget suggestion was one in which they were using evaluations to shape that budget. I can tell you now that the Mexican government and almost all government states are working to reduce poverty using evaluations. And they do that every year over the past five years. How is it possible that every year the budget is done using the evaluation of almost 150 social programs? So this is happening every year in Mexico. How is it possible that we can do that? So let me tell you this short story. In the year 2006, Congress, through a social development law, created an independent institution, it's called CONEVAL, the National Council for the Evolution of Social Policies, with two objectives. A, to evaluate all programs, all social programs and all social strategies of government and state governors. And B, the second object of Carnival is to measure poverty at the national, state, and municipality level. Not only that, but as you, as you can see, this poverty measurement is using seven dimensions. Within the poverty measurement, we have household income, we have education gap, we have the lack of access to health services, the lack of access to social security, the lack of access to, quality, to, to, a, to a house with quality, and the lack of access of having services in housing, and as well, the lack of access to food. We have seven elements. One is income, and the other six is about social rights. So over the past almost eight years, Carnival has been working on those two elements, producing evidence, producing impact evaluations and design evaluations and process evaluations of almost 150 programs every year, different types of evaluation. And also at the same time, we've been measuring poverty at a national, state, and municipality level. At the very beginning, we thought it's going to be very simple to convince policymakers to use evidence. It was not that simple. 
until something interesting happened. So we started to produce, produce evidence, both in terms of evaluations and also in terms of poverty indicators. But as you know, as we all know, there is always a struggle to convince policymakers, to convince politicians to use our scientific evidence. This is not that easy. Sometimes we are a bit naive in thinking that all policymakers, all politicians, are going to listen to us carefully. And everything, everything we're going to say, in terms of science, in terms of evidence, is going to be used immediately by, by policymakers. It is not that way, unfortunately. Unless we have a bridge. Unless we have a bridge between the evidence we produce and their political incentives. We understood quite well over the past five to six years that a poverty indicator is a very sens sensible political indicator. A poverty indicator is very sensitive for the media. And therefore, policymakers, politicians, are not happy when poverty goes up either in the country or in the states. We understand that policymakers have political incentives. They want to be perhaps presidents in the future. They want their political party to win in the next election. And therefore, they don't like poverty to go up. They don't want poverty to increase. And therefore, what is happening is that we are linking our evidence to those political incentives and over the past five to six years we have governors, we have ministers and we have even the president worried about poverty and they understand that they, can, they cannot reduce poverty through tampering poverty figures. The only way they can reduce poverty is through public policy. And therefore, the next question they have, if they want to reduce poverty, even for political incentives, the next question is, can you tell us which evidence you have in terms of programs to reduce poverty through their impact? Therefore, what they want to know is, what is the evaluation telling us in terms of programs? Which program is the best one to reduce the deprivation of housing. Which one is the program or the programs which are the best to reduce the educational gap? Which programs are the best ones to reduce poverty in general? And therefore, what we have over the past five to six years is that we keep having questions from policymakers in terms of evaluations and the evidence in terms of programs. For this reason, the federal government and also the state governors decide a national strategy for inclusion. This strategy is about organizing ministers, organizing offices, organizing governments in terms of their different goals to reduce poverty. So, for instance, it is quite an important goal for the Ministry of Education. They know that if they place a child in school, they have a reduction on the educational gap and therefore they have a reduction in poverty. If, for instance, the Ministry of Health, they increase the access to health services, they have a reduction in health deprivation and they have a reduction in poverty. And therefore, this national strategy for inclusion, they have different goals in different ministries. They have the same goals 
for the state governors, and therefore the government is using this specific way of measuring poverty to organize a quite logical strategy to reduce poverty, which includes trying to know which programs, which social tools, which policy make, which policy uh, is the best one to reduce poverty in different dimensions. What happened over the past two years finally is that poverty went down between 2014 and 2016 when this national strategy for inclusion was at the, at the highest with the most important element of coordination. So despite of increasing poverty between 2010 and 2014 due to, the, to economic problems, with the help of this strategy, with the help of evidence, the government was able to prioritize the best programs in order to reduce poverty. Not only that, this strategy included as well trying to convince the central bank to reduce inflation even more and to increase employment through the Ministry of, of Economy. And therefore, between 2014 and 16, we have this important virtuous cir circle. Reduce poverty, both in terms of the economic uh, process and evolution in Mexico and public policy. So, in this way, it's been quite interesting that both the element of poverty measurement and evaluations together were able to be used in a systematic way by policymakers. So, as a summary, our Mexican constitution said that a very important element for Mexico is to address social rights. Then, Congress developed a policy indicator using social rights and income, and Congress as well created an independent body to measure poverty. We've been measuring poverty at a national, state, and municipality level, and politicians understand that poverty indicator is very important in terms of their political incentives. No one likes poverty to go up in the, in the country or in the states. And therefore, the government created a better coordination policy to reduce poverty. So, over the past five years, we have this element in which evidence has been used in a very systematic way by policymakers. So what is happening right now is that policymakers in general, they are using the evidence we produce both in terms of evaluations and in terms of poverty indicators. Did we think this was going to happen? I don't think so. We really thought 10 years ago that we're going to struggle more in terms of convincing policymakers to listen and then to use evidence. We thought we're going to knock too many doors and present ourselves as well-trained scientists and academics which are producing evidence to be used by policymakers. We didn't think that both the Ministry of Finance, the federal one, or the governors should be asking for evidence every year. And I think the magic, which we didn't expect, was that a poverty indicator is a very powerful indicator in terms of political incentives. So every time 
We want politicians to pay attention to evidence. I believe that we have to discover how can we convince them through linking our evidence to their political incentives. And we have to apply that to many other fields. For instance, at the end of the day, development is bigger than only poverty. In the case of Mexico, we really want to convince policymakers to increase effective access to social rights, not only to follow a very basic poverty indicator, because our indicator is measuring only the very basic elements of our seven dimensions. How can we convince policymakers? How can we produce a bigger and more powerful indicator than a poverty indicator? which is political sensitive. If we manage to do that, then in the long run, the development in Mexico will grow faster. Our challenge, and I think the challenge in this table is, are we able to produce evidence for which policymakers uh, pay attention? How can we produce evidence thinking in the way politicians think. Thank you very much. Our final speaker in this afternoon's plenary is Nathaniel Otu. Nathaniel worked for over 10 years with Ghana's National Health Insurance Authority. In 2015, he rose to become the CEO of the authority a position he held until he resigned in February 2017. His previous work experience spans the social security, manufacturing and trade promotion sectors. Welcome, Nathaniel. Thank you, Chair. And I want to extend my heartfelt thanks to the organisers for deeming it fit to get me to um, participate on this panel. But I, there is something I would never trade, and that is speaking um, at a conference as the last person, because I get to hand out the grades. <laughs> so um, I'm going to take you through some of our experiences uh, dealing with equity in Ghana's National Health Insurance Scheme. Uh, it's rather a long presentation, but I'll go through it in record time, because a quarter of my slides are placeholders. That's the structure of my presentation. Uh, I start with the antecedents. Pre-independence in Ghana, um, the issues were about equity in healthcare. Um, the health system then was created for the colonial class and it didn't cater to the local people. And so when we had self-government between 1951 and 1957, uh, our preoccupation was to build a health system that responded to the needs of our people in terms of access to services, financing, human resources, etc. And as time went on, these challenges, in spite of gaining independence, did not abate. They rather aggravated. And so, in the first phase between 1957 and 1966, the issues that we were confronted with where whether we paid fees at the point of service delivery, uh, whether private practice was to be promoted in public hospitals, and then we moved on to another phase, still talking about user fees, and the issue of whether we still have private practice paid for with a public purse. Then we go on to another phase where fees are still an issue, uh, but then expansion of primary health care uh, was concentrated on a bit. The next phase, 1972 to 81, we were still di discussing user fees, and we talked about primary health services for the population. Well, what we saw was that the free health care we had could not be sustained, so as time went on, it started giving us poor results. And over the period, what happened was that a number of initiatives and phases 
uh, came in. So first, uh, we started with surcharges on medicines in order to ensure that we could recover the cost a bit. This went into full force um, sometime in the 80s where we started charging user fees for medicines only, of course, in order to make sure they were available because the economy was really rough at that time. Then we went on to the Bamako Initiative, also meant to ensure access to medicines and communities empowerment in ensuring that health services were available. Then we went on to a despised system in Ghana, which we call cash and carry, which was payment of fees at the point of service delivery. And this had a very serious effect on our health system. And so prior to the health insurance scheme, which we call the NHIS, this is what we had. Uh, a model that was founded on free healthcare, but could not be sustained with user fees being introduced. And then we had cash and carry. At that time, only 20% of the population could access the healthcare they needed. The system was not compatible with our socioeconomic status because people didn't have the money to pay for healthcare at the point of delivery. But better still, and more so importantly, it was uh, not in sync with our cultural and political context because people got turned away, as uh, Sifo said, because they couldn't pay for healthcare. And in response to this, the community started um, putting together health schemes of their own, community health insurance schemes, and finally this morphed into a national health insurance scheme for which I worked for 10 years. Now the inequities that the health insurance scheme sought to address were first the burden of catastrophic healthcare expenditure on the population, uh, the lack of financial access to a majority of the population, lack of access to quality healthcare, poor geographical access, and the intractable problem of out-of-pocket payments, which at the time hovered in excess of 60% uh, as part of private health, health expenditure. And so the NHIS gets established, but it was a difficult start. Why was it so? It was a major campaign promise of the government that set it up, and the government was interested to implement it at all costs. Now, at the time, Ghana had opted for the highly indebted poor country initiative, HIPIC, and the NHIS was coming in at this time, and the, the skepticism was, where were we getting money, or where were we going to get money to fund this? And then again, there came political opposition. The opposition party walked out during the debates. The trade union congress, that's the unions, also called for a strike because workers' money was going to be used to fund part of the health insurance scheme. The IMF supported the trade union's position because the IMF thought that pension schemes money should not be used to support the NHIS. Part of the NHIS advisory group walked out because they felt alienated because of the direction of the discussion as it went. They felt there was not a lot of attention paid to rigor and evidence. And the launch of the NHIS was postponed a number of times because of the fear of sabotage. But audacity actually came in. And because of audacity, the president of the time launched the NHIS against all odds under the theme protecting the poor and putting healthcare in the hands of the people. And the theme was really selected to ensure that the health insurance scheme um, resonated with the people of the country. At the launch, the president said, with the scheme in place, every, and I underline every, Ghanaian should have access to immediate, affordable health care. The NHIS promise included a number of things, including re-equipping health care facilities, eliminating payments at the point of service delivery, training more health care staff, and so on. But the NHIS policy uh, was by no means less audacious than some of the things that I've stated there. You can see uh, George Osborne, the Chancellor of the SGK of the UK, what he said. He says, government was committed to full employment in Britain. And the Education Secretary said they were going to eliminate illiteracy in their time. At the IHI, IHI is the Institute for Health uh, Improvement, they had a saying that some is not a number and soon is not a time. Setting a common goal and a clear time frame and pursuing it together can unleash amazing energy and productivity and creativity. 
And the administrator of Washington, D.C. said he wants to contribute his part to making sure that business is audacious and not business as usual. So what was the structure of the NHIS and what's the structure right now? The risk pooling architecture actually brings money from tax sources, so 25% VAT, 2.5% uh, VAT, 2.5% transfer of social security funds, as well as investing the NHIS funds to make interest. And there are other minor sources as I've listed the road accident fund and workman's compensation comp uh, returns to the fund. Then there are premiums, which are minimal, based on ability to pay and other income. All that money is pulled into the middle. Part of it goes to the Ministry of Finance, which transfers it to the National Health Insurance Fund. Part goes directly to the fund, and other parts go to district health insurance schemes. Those monies that are pulled are used for the payments on the right-hand side. That is for um, health insurance claims, administration, as well as investments in the health sector. The NHIS has a generous exemptions policy, and this policy sees only 30% of the population pay premiums. The rest of the population do not pay premiums, and they're exempted completely. Uh, but as you can see in that schema there, there are minor processing fee that some groups pay. Uh, the indigent pregnant women and persons with mental health conditions pay nothing at all. The benefits package is uh, for OPD services, inpatient services, emergencies, investigations, medicines, the following are exempted or excluded, HIV antiretroviral drugs, uh, cancers apart from breast and cervical cancer, TB care, cosmetic surgery, dental implants, and eyeglasses. So the dawn of evidence. The first brushes with evidence at the NHIS uh, came at a time when I was uh, sitting at the table. As you know, I've seen the NHIS through many iterations. And the first publication to cause jitters in our corridors was uh, by the um, Danida Health Sector Support Office titled, Does the NHIS Cover the Poor? And everybody got incensed about this because it was a suspicion that the donor community was trying to denigrate a homegrown initiative. That's how we, we reacted. Then came the citizens' assessment uh, of the health insurance scheme. And this was a study conducted by the National Development Planning Commission, a government body. Obviously, there couldn't be the same reaction to the Danida paper. But what was the NHI's reaction? Uh, there was selective acceptance of the results. And also, the impact of the study was lost because in 2009, soon after it had been launched, there was a change in government. CIFO, this is interesting for you because soon after there was a publication by Oxfam titled Free Investor Healthcare in Ghana. Is it a shared goal? And this was in 2011. And this um, paper actually challenged a lot of stance that the NHIS had and had been putting out. And what was the response? It was perceived as a foreign attack on an initial, you know, initiative that was local. Oxfam's strategy to push its own healthcare of health, a model of healthcare coverage throughout the world, a hostile reaction and, a, you know, um, an attack on the credibility of Oxfam. But something good came out of it. Quietly, this paper became a catalyst for policy change. And I do know how that happened because I was at the table. So then gradually the NHIS warms up to evidence uh, and starts commission, commissioning re research. Um, is doing collaborative presentations at scientific conferences, doing publications, and actually rolling out research interventions, um, not one, not two, but a number of them. So the tide is changing. How has the scheme performed? Membership uh, was at... Um, almost 41% uh, in 2015, and I must admit, it has plateaued since, it's not growing. Why is it so? There are a number of factors, I'll come to some of them. This is how the membership is divvied up. So the majority of the membership of the scheme are you know, people under 18 children, basically, because they're exempted. 
And the, what we call the informal sector in Ghana is not really the informal sector. The definition is any person that pays premiums and processing fees. Then you have persons under above 70 uh, and the indigent. And the indigent area is interesting because I'll come back to it a little later on. So as you can see here, the breadth and the scope of services, uh, the breadth of covering the scope of services uh, are not totally 100%. Um, As you can see, the breadth of coverage is only 41%, and the height of services that are provided, you can see on top, not all services are assured to the population. So if you do you know, a calculation of the, um, the, 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 the population that has access actively to health services, it might be less than the NHIS represents. This is how outpatient services have been used over the years. Uh, it has grown from 5.97 to 29.6 million a year uh, in 2014. And to say also that OPD utilization since the inception of the NHIS has doubled in Ghana. Well, most recently, in spite of the challenges, um, we saw that you know, in 2008, uh, there was quite a bit of inequity in the health insurance scheme, as was pointed out by the National Development Planning Report. But in 2014, it was very likely for someone in the lower quintiles to use the health insurance service as much as people in the higher quintiles. So how are we trying to resolve some of these equity issues? Uh, what we've tried to do is to make it easier for people uh, in those classes that are exempted, the poor and vulnerable, to have easy access. So in the past, they had to show up at health insurance offices every year to renew their membership, but we're saying that we want to do it for two years because showing up at the office to register itself is expensive in terms of transport time and so on. Now, so following that, we also came up with a system where we developed a means testing using, um, you know, PMTs that are put onto um, a computer and using that to assess people using enumerators that go around the communities. The NHIS has also done something interesting, which is interesting and useful to point out. For the first time, the NHIS has actually legislated the reporting on equity of the scheme in section 25 of the law. Uh, and as you can see, what this does is to put up the, you know, the platform and the opportunity for researchers and people interested in evidence to actually develop evidence on how equitable the NHIS is. But equity challenges still remain. And in 2004, 14, we did an assessment of how um, the vulnerable and poor groups were being registered onto the NHIS, doing a comparison with the core poverty incidents under GLSS, GLSS 6. And what we found out was that the poorest regions in the country were actually enrolling less people uh, on the exempt categories as the more wealthy regions of the country. And this called us to action. And as a result, we, we included um, registration of the poor and vulnerable as indicators for our district offices and continually monitored it. And we saw an improvement. Again, we have equity issues with the quality of services and the facilities that people have choice to go to. So as you can see here, during the accreditation in 2014, only 0.32% 0 0 of all facilities made a grade A plus, and a grade A was 46 meaning that a lot of our population were relegated to attending grade B, C, and D health facilities. And I think this is an issue of equity as well. There are other equity implications. I'll summarize this. In 2014, we wanted to roll out a capitation system. So what we did was to go around and do a facility assessment in two rounds. The first region was Ashanti region. The second region was regions were Upper East, Upper West, and Volta regions. And if you look at it, in the Ashanti region, 80% of facilities opened 24-7. Uh, in the other region, 65%. Facilities with a physician or health assistant, 50% as against 18%. And so you can see the mismatch and the inequities in the system 
as also shown by the other uh, areas that we looked at. And still inequities exist between insured and non-insured, between uh, the pe benefits packages that are offered, the bias you know, against PHC and quality of care and choice. Out of, care, out of pocket payments are still rife and a problem. The challenges of the NHIS numerous. I have summarized them here and we keep to work on them. We, we keep working on them every time. The greatest of them is financial sustainability. And as you can see, the scheme is in deficit and has been for almost seven years. So looking ahead, there was a reform instituted in 2015 to improve or seek knowledge and evidence about how to improve the NHIS. Uh, it looked at sustainability, equity, efficiency, accountability, and user satisfaction as the key areas for review. Now, the review itself was evidence-based, started with a desk review, key informant interviews, stakeholder consultations, call for submission of papers, et cetera, et cetera, until the final report was finished. So the recommendations, sustainability, efficiency, and equity, as well as accountability and user satisfaction, these were really the areas in which we had recommendations for the review and the improvement of the scheme. And so if the review proposal is accepted, this is the kind of uh, scheme that we're going to see, a scheme that guarantees primary health care for the entire population and also protects those vulnerable and poor people by paying for their health care throughout this whole system. Now, the NHIS wants to preserve what works and also improve the benefits package. And it is our view that because of the bipartisan nature in which the review was done, the current government will look at it and its recommendations. So this is where the NHIS wants to get to the middle, where we can all stand and enjoy a match being played by our favorite team. And my reflections are that audacity spares innovative policies. Evidence provides the fuel for policy to thrive, but each has its limitations. And so I leave you with this message, lest we forget. Science is inadequate, but it is only when we understand this inadequacy that our science has value. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nathaniel. We have some time for questions. So if you have a question, can you please come to the microphone? Uh, tell us your name and where you're from. And if there's an individual speaker you'd like to address your question to, please let us know. Thank you. We can start up here on my right. Hi, my name's, can you hear me? Yeah. I'm Rebecca Syed. I live in Thailand and I'm co-coordinating editor of the Cochrane Schizophrenia Group. And my question and comment really is around equity in healthcare research globally. And really, um, it comes from sitting in Bogota, I'd like to say 10 years ago, but I think it was a bit longer, and doing a survey of trials from low and middle income countries. And there were very few trials, and sadly, the tri a lot of the trials that were done, of the very few that were done, were um, relevant to the health needs of high income countries. So bringing it back to sort of systematic reviews um, within the schizophrenia group, the way that we've tried to keep some equity is to invite questions from people from low and middle income countries. May they be experienced or inexperienced authors and help them realize those um, research questions and those systematic reviews. Um, the secondary outcome, positive outcome is, that is to improve the training um, and knowledge of evidence-based medicine in those places, which is great. But I think as things tighten up, certainly within Cochrane, um, and you know, we're looking at quality rather than quantity, which I don't disagree with. I think quality is incredibly important. And also looking at the questions that are important to policymakers. I think um, our speakers made it very clear that policymakers need to hear what they want to know, but also what they don't want to know. Um, and I'm just wondering as a panel how um, not just the questions from policymakers, but the questions of relevance to people and clinicians in low and middle income countries 
can um, be prioritised in Cochrane or any producer of systematic reviews? Sorry, that was a long question. Gonzalo, can I just check that you could hear that question? I hear this, uh, I hear that somehow, yes, yes. Great, okay. I'd offer to repeat it, but I don't think I could. No. So, Gonzalo, the question was around mechanisms for ensuring the questions of importance to people in low and middle income countries, be they policy makers or clinicians, influence the research agenda. Can I ask Sifo or Nathaniel? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just quickly on the issue of. Um, you know, we saw this and we've seen it across the board of how, you know, the re global research agenda, right, um, often follows the patterns of inequity. And so, you know, um, that's how, you know, it happened with HIV. That's how it's happening with many of the things. Um, and so it is an important issue. And, and I, but I think that what we're seeing more increasingly is that, and this is a positive thing, I keep referring to the kind of opportunities that were provided to us by the HIV AIDS movement, but I mean, you know, the kind of HIV AIDS crisis, but one of the things that we're seeing emerge out of that crisis is the interconnectedness of researchers across the world who are able to share information, you know, about what is happening in a localized community and how, you know, that it should inform a global research study you know, happening, um, you know, across countries. And so it is I an mean, important issue. And I think, you know, there are many opportunities that exist. Um, and I think the initiative by Cochrane of creating, you know, communities of practice where people are able to inform each other across spaces um, is really <coughs> important. And there are many examples of, you know, where we've seen with vaccine research, for instance, um, you know, where we are seeing the tide slightly turn and that research that would in the past, um, you know, not be being done or led from the south, but with, you know, the participation of a global community of research practitioners is taking place. Um, and, and so I guess my point is that there are opportunities, um, you know, emerging now and we're learning from each of the crises and building on that, and so, um, yeah. Well, I, I, I would just say the issue is twofold, contextualization of issues, and the second thing is actually um, setting priority to, to deal with them. Um, as we all know, our resources are limited. Our problems are many and intractable in most cases. And so what happens is what gets to the top of the pile as a priority and how do we get to select it is really what happens in most places. For a lot of the time, we don't have the rigor to do that. And I think this rigor is something that we must keep building. But also to remember that problems are not the same everywhere. They are context specific. And therefore, for each context, we need to have the right expertise to deal with it. Um, Gonzalo, could I ask if you would like to also make a comment on this question about uh, trials in uh, low middle income country settings. I, I, I'm fine with that, thank you. Great, thank you. I think maybe there is another question. No? Okay, well if there are no other questions, I'd just like to sum up by saying the SIFO talked is of evidence combined with courage and persistence. Is there no question I can Oh, ask? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sunday. No? Okay. So um, SIFO talked can of I? evidence combined with courage and persistence. Okay. And, no, I'm sorry, Gonzalo. There are no further questions. I'm just mm -hmm. summing the session up. Apologies for the delay. All right. Sure. Okay, so SIFO talking of evidence combined with courage and persistence as a tool for advocacy, accountability, and giving power to the people.
Gonzalo showed us how using measurement can link evidence to political incentives. And Nathaniel showed us the opportunities and challenges universal health coverage through the experience in Ghana. So all we have left to do for this final session is to join Vivian and I in thanking our speakers very much indeed for their important insights. Thank you.